Hello and welcome to How Did This Not Get Made? This is the podcast where we talk about the movies that never made it to the theaters, the scripts that were never filmed, and the ideas that never even made it to the page. My name is David Spencer. My name is Daniel Kaka. All right, and I know that this is going to be a big one, so I think we should just jump right into it. What are we talking about today, Dan? So we are going to be talking about the thief in the cobbler, but after doing a lot of the research, this is going to be more about Richard Williams than anything. Oh, okay. Yeah. I know about this movie, and I think I might have been the one to bring this to your attention, but yes. I this is one of those stories that I've always heard about of this, you know, incredible animated feature that never was finished and never released the way it was intended to, mm-hmm. and this, you know, incredible, beautiful animated sequences, but I don't really know much more about the story beyond that. Yeah. It's a lot, and it kind of weaves itself through the history of animation and mm. kind of touches upon like anyone and almost everyone who's been part of animation. So whenever you watch any animated movie, TV show nowadays, more likely than not, that animator has been either taught or been inspired by Richard Williams in some way, shape or form. Mm. Because of Richard Williams, we have a lot to think because of him all right yeah the animator richard williams who is best known for his animation in who framed roger rabbit he conceived the idea of the thief and the cobbler back in 1964 back then it was called the amazing nazardin the production went through its ups and downs in development hell and eventually was released in 1995. For many animators and actors, this was their final film they worked on, including Ken Harris, who died in 1982, Grim Natwick, who died in 1990, and Art Babbitt, who died in 1992, as well as a few actors like Felix Elmer, who died in 1979, Kenneth Williams in 1988, Sir Anthony Coyle, died in 1989 in Vincent Price in 1993, which was a month after the film's initial release. Wow. The production holds the Guinness World Record for longest production time. Before that, it was a 1954 film called Tiffland, which held the record for being in production for 20 years later. So what the hell happened? Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. What, from the 60s to the early 90s? 64 is when the first idea was conceived, and 95 is when it got its U.S. release. It was released in 93 initially, but then it got bought out by Miramax, reworked, and redistributed here in the United States in 95. Wow. Yeah. So I guess this is technically the first, you know, thing we're talking about where there was mm-hmm. some semblance of this project released, but as I'm sure we'll get into it, it's very different than mm-hmm. the movie that it was supposed to be. Yes. Where I want to start though is with Williams himself. Okay. When I was 5, I saw Snow White and my mother was an illustrator. So I was a sophisticated little kid. I'd grown up in commercial art studios. And I knew that those were drawings, all them. And I wanted to be an animator. During his teen years, he tried to be a painter, but that pursuit didn't last very long, and he went back to attempting animation. In 1955, he moved to London from Ontario, Canada, after doing some commercial work, thinking that he could do much more there. For the first few years, he struggled to find work until he met Bob Godfrey. He got him jobs working commercials and illustrations. Bob Godfrey helped me. He had a biographic films then, and I worked in the basement, and I did work in kind. I would do some commercial animation or commercial stills, 
drawings or something. And then he'd let me use the camera. So he did a barter system. After working for Bob for a while, Dick found the money and eventually worked on his first short film, The Little Island. which actually won a BAFTA award for Best Animated Film back in 1958. Mm. So, yeah, just from three years later, from moving to London, he was making a BAFTA-worthy animated short. Wow. It wasn't until 1962 that Dick Williams... So, I, I had found out that he actually went by Dick Okay. in there. So, you'll hear me kind of go back and forth between <laughs> saying Richard and Dick. So it was in 1962, he found financial and critical success with his short, Love Me, Love Me, Love Me. Why does nobody love me? This enabled Williams to start his own animation studio, Richard Williams Animation, which was located on 13 Soho Square in Soho, London, which is kind of like the uh, Burbank area of Hollywood. <laughs> it's like, that's where things are really made is up there. Yeah, yeah. There he had a handful of employees, mostly secretaries and animators. There they completed over 2,500 TV commercials and won numerous awards. Wow. Do you have like over the course of what time that those commercials were made? I think that's overall. Oh, okay. This is kind of, yeah, overall what the studio has done. And the studio has been around for, I think, until the 90s. Gotcha, is gotcha. That it's been there. But still, that's that's impressive. That is a lot. But you're probably not going to notice a lot of their commercial work because the studio also worked for a lot of movies in making their title sequences for films like What's New Pussycat, What's new, Pussycat? Casino Royale, A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, The Charge of the Light Brigade. The Return of the Pink Panther in The Pink Panther Strikes Again. In 1964, Williams did illustrations for a book series translated by Idris Shaw, which was a collection of comedic Persian folklore tales of Mullah Nasruddin. This is what sparked the idea in Williams' head. He had so much fun creating the illustrations, but he thought it would be best if we took the stories and made it into an animated feature film. He approached Shaw with the idea. They agreed to make the film and split the profits in half. Soon after, Dick hired Idris's brother, Omar, as a producer to work out the business aspects of the film. So right away, we get the start of this, and that has to do with Nasruddin. Now, Nasruddin is not a story that was actually made up by Idris Shaw. He actually mm -hmm. translated a lot of these stories and published them. Oh, were they like old folklore type things? Yeah, so it's kind of like how the Brothers Grimm is credited for all the fairy tales when in actuality they were just collecting all the stories, translating yeah. them, and just kind of compiling them all together. This is kind of the same idea of taking these uh, Persian folklore, specifically about Nesredin, who's very much like Don Quixote is to Spain, Nesredin was to Persia. Okay. So that kind of gives a better perspective on these stories, yeah. So production has begun on the amazing Nesredin, which is what they initially called the project. Taking on a feature animation is not easy. This isn't just the 30-second commercials that they were used to. He began to bring in other animators like Ken Harris, who worked as a Warner Brothers animator for 26 years, and Roy Nasbitt, who is a background animator who did a promotional art show that featured Indian and Persian designs. So that's kind of why he was brought on there. Later on, Nesbitt actually worked on Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. Oh, wow. Yeah. This is like 64 we're talking right now. 1964, 1965. Yeah, 64, 65 is about the time and kind of going into the 70s. I'm not sure if you're about to get into this, but mm -hmm. I know that Walt Disney passed away in 1966. So mm. this would be at a time where the Mr. Animation, the person that people think of when they think of animated movies... 
passes mm-hmm. away, the Disney company is scrambling to figure out what to do next. And like oh. they were kind of in a, a tumultuous period between his mm-hmm. death and uh, I mean, really going up into like the late 80s. But especially this early day, they're, you know, trying to finish productions that Walt was working on. But I imagine that's part of the story here is that Mr. Animation is no longer there. And this Richard Williams could very well be seeing this and Mm -hmm. seeing that this movie could be, you know, make his company the next Walt Disney Pictures. I don't really know much about Disney history, especially around the time that Walt died. Mm -hmm. I do know that while in production, a lot of these animated productions, Walt would be the front. He would be the head guy of all of these animation like he would be the guy who would sit down in front of the storyboard and actually act out the entire movie in front of the animators and then just kind of send them off and actually <laughs> do the work that they're supposed to which I'm, I'm sure they're sitting there thinking like okay this is at this point he's just showing off how much he knows the story yeah with him gone that's pretty interesting to know if yeah. any of those animators just up and left because i know that for a lot of those animators they were being controlled by walt and i know walt oh, wanted yeah. them to basically be there almost 24 7 even trying to create like a almost weird utopia neighborhood he was trying to build like his own little city <laughs> Yeah. On the Disney back lot so that none of the animators could leave at all, at least leave the yeah, premises. Yeah. They would go home, but their home would be still on the studio. Oh, yeah. Walt Disney had a lot of problems, especially when it came to how he uh, treated his workers. And it's yeah. also complete conjecture on my part to think that the death of Walt Disney factored into anything going on with the production hmm. or how people in the production kind of viewed this movie that they were making. I just do think it's interesting timing that this fable of a animated masterpiece gets Mm -hmm. started at around the same time. Huh. That might be why he got so many people on board and like the list of animators who I listed as like that being their last project. A lot of them were coming from Disney animation and from Warner Brothers. Oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll we'll go into more of that later. The movie's starting. This is around like starting from 64, we're going into the 70s. At first the film was financed by Williams. While they were making the film, the studio was still making title sequences, commercials. They even did the Christmas Carol adaptation. What's today? Hey! <laughs> An intelligent boy. Oh, a remarkable boy. <laughs> What's today, my fine young fellow? Today? Christmas Day! What? It's Christmas Day. It's Christmas Day. And I haven't missed it. Which actually won an Academy Award for Best Animated Short in 1972. Hmm. Yeah, with this film, it's financed by Richard Williams Animation Studio. But it's not actually funded by a major studio. So all of this was just done as a side project. And any money that they were making, or at least any money that Williams was making on the side from doing commercials and just taking on these jobs was just going right back into making this film Hmm. and paying those animators to keep on drawing into overtime. It's like Pixar, you know, was doing all these tech demos and corporate shorts and all of these for you know 10 Mm -hmm. or 15 years trying to get to a point where they could make toy story yeah so then into the 1970s the project was retitled the majestic fool at the time they actually found a distributor the british lion film corporation their staff increased to 40 animators now working on this film wow yeah you know he was married (laughs) through all of this (laughs) I was just absolutely shocked by knowing this. Like, I was reading all these stories about him. I was watching either documentaries or, like, video essays about him. And they make it pretty far in his life. And they're like, oh, yeah, and then he married his third wife. Yeah, this guy has been married four times in his life. Oh, wow. Yeah. He divorced his first wife before moving to London. He later remarried in London and had two kids with her. She eventually divorced him in 1976. 
I mean, it kind of makes sense as to why, because Dick was just never home. Yeah. Or whenever he was home, like he was still animating at home. And he demanded that like everyone in the house be quiet so that he could concentrate. So for her life, like there wasn't much to it. It's like he would go off, he would work, make these amazing animations, come home, keep on animating. And just like, well, I, I guess I just don't know who this guy is at all. Yeah. <laughs> it all makes sense. In 1972, that's when Williams hired the composer Howard Blake to score the film. And this is where a lot of things changed. Mm. Within the eight years of production, the studio actually created about three hours of animation. And the story was a mess. Mm. When it came to Richard Williams, his animation style is just absolutely incredible and amazing. But I have noticed that when it comes to story and story structure, it's something that is not his strong suit. Mm. He really needs someone else there to really put together a story. It's kind of like with Brian Williams. like He can create wonderful wonderful music but when it comes to coming up with lyrics it's just he can't do it and that's why he had to bring in van dyke parks to help him write lyrics but the film that they ended up doing or at least what they were animating was basically just a series of short stories and nazardin was the common denominator through all these short Mm. stories like they weren't connected to each other it was just like he went through an adventure went through another adventure. So it wasn't really a story per se, or at least like a grand story. So Howard Blake then convinced Williams that he needed to make one big story with a three-act structure. Got to Hollywood it. Yeah. (laughs) You ever read Save the Cat? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I have that book here. Anyway. That's just my um, uh, (laughs) go-to movie producer telling somebody they need to fix their script is Mm -hmm. go read Save the Cat. (laughs) But, I mean, he was hesitant at first. That makes sense. I mean, I would be too. Like, you have three hours of animation. You put in all this work. Your wife divorced you over this. And you're like, I have to start over? Yeah. And eventually, he he agreed. He's like, all right, well, we'll do it. So, while Williams was dealing with this overwhelming task of rewriting and reanimating this passion project... The studio's finances went all fuck up. It was all because of the producer, Omar Shaw. So, turns out, he took some of the studio's money, and he never wrote it down. So, Dick Mm. confronted Omar about embezzlement and wanted to renegotiate the deal with Idris. And then on top of that, Idris's sister, Amina, was suing for the rights of the film because she claimed that she also translated a lot of those stories alongside Idris. Oh, wow. On top of that, Paramount withdrew the deal that they were negotiating with Williams to make this movie. And that's when William and the Shaw family finally decided to split, leaving the rights of Nazardin entirely to the Shaw family, thus ending this project. Almost. (laughs) Wow. Wow. This happened at the same time that he got this message from their composer Mm -hmm. to redo the film anyways. It just seemed like all of these red flags were just all lining up and it just, it was just a domino effect. Not only did you do it (laughs) wrong, but you're not even allowed to do it anymore. They left and then (laughs) I'm sure Paramount's looking at them and they're like, cool, are you going to make this movie? He's like, yeah, we're going to make a movie, but we're also going to have to rewrite the whole thing. And also we lost the rights to it, so... Can you still fund us? I'm like, no, no, that'd be dumb. Man. <laughs> I'm sure they're like, when you get your shit together, then we'll talk later. But yeah, that's got to be harsh because, I mean, they were already going full throttle into this. They got the British Lion Film Corporation backing them. They're getting more employees. Paramount's yeah. getting to notice them. And I'm sure that's when Omar was like, oh, look at all this money. That's now mine. Oh, yeah. yeah. This may be jumping ahead. Is there any footage of that first cut that's just kind of a series of shorts that is has survived this and is still out there? A film about him is in the making by Richard Williams. Here, Nasruddin is hauled before the king, accused of heresy. Oh, wise men. 
What is bread? Weird. Stupid quip. <laughs> While the Shaw family owned the rights to Nazruddin and all the stories, there was a character that was entirely made up for the film that Williams had the right to use, and that was the thief. The thief, who's an idiot, steals the three golden balls. The thief was created for the amazing Nasruddin as a comic relief character that would follow around Nasruddin. He soon started developing an entire story that surrounded that character. Okay. Yeah. So the thief character, he's the green alien looking character with the big robe and he has a uh, okay. little fruit flies always above his head. <laughs> now we're into 1973. Not only did Williams take howard blake's advice to make a big epic story he actually hired him to write a new story for him and blake ended up writing a treatment called tin tack now williams continued to write the script based on blake's treatment with the help of his now third wife who was margaret french Hmm. the movie was later renamed to the thief the story retained the persian themes from nasruddin the thief had a much bigger role but the story introduced a cobbler named Tack. Cobbler? What's your name? Tack? Is that your name? Tack? A character loosely based on Harry Langdon, Buster Keaton, and Charlie Chaplin in the ways that he was clumsy, but would always come out of a situation just fine. So we have the comic relief character has become the main character, And gets a new comic Mm -hmm. relief character. Correct. So we have two comic (laughs) relief characters. It's great. So these two characters were then developed to be silent through most of the film, letting their actions dominate what they were thinking and conveying to the audience. Other characters that were developed, but inspired by characters from Nazruddin, changing them just enough so that they seemed original. There was a sleepy king who is just the lazy king Nod in the new adaptation. The nurse that serves the princess and Zigzag was based on a character named Anwar, the villain of Nazruddin. Such wise men as these are ignorant. So Zigzag not only was one of the few characters that spoke in the film, he also had to speak entirely in rhyme. Oh, weird. Gentlemen, gentlemen, <laughs> what a delight to meet you all here on such a fine night. And Zigzag was actually voiced by Vincent Price. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. cool. Yeah, oh, it's really cool. And hearing his voice, like he just, he has this flow with his voice just that works so well, especially when you're working with rhyme. It's like every line that he speaks is basically a poem that he's doing. This is an animated movie that's really trying to go pure in it's the animation that's telling the story. We're not going to, you know, be yes. using dialogue as much as we can avoid it and mm-hmm. really letting the visual speak for itself. It's it's a remarkable medium. You can do anything. You can, and you can change it, you see. So other characters that were in this Princess Yum Yum who is Tax Love Interest. It was played by Sarah Crow. At the moment, Daddy, I need a cobbler. And was modeled after the character Zahra Begum, which is the animators actually sat down and watched the character, studied how the character moved, and that's who Princess Yum Yum was modeled after. Hmm. With the rewrite, that included a whole new cast, like the Mad Holy Old Witch. Attack. See? But it's what you do with what you got. Go home! Now! Who is voiced by Joan Sims, who also voices the nurse. The nice young man is in your slippers, my dear. Yes, Nanny. There's the mighty One Eye, voiced by Christopher Greener. One Eyes win again! And the cast of Brigants. What does the book say? Caravan! Caravan! Charge! 
there to help tack along the way in his journey. Brigands are pretty interesting. They're just kind of like this crew of desert bandits. They're just kind of mindless soldiers. They're interesting. When you watch the movie, you'll you'll see. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So the story was there. The characters are created. And all that's left to make the movie was money. And they had none. The movie soon turned into a side project for the studio as there was a desperate need for money. To save money, Williams had Ken Harris, the chief animator, only do pencil sketch animation. They did not want to spend any money on coloring, tracing, painting, and camera work. Hmm. Yeah, Have you ever seen how Warner Brother animations were made in the camera work? A little bit. Camera work is something that we never really think about when yeah. it comes to animation. Uh, I think Fox did a a really interesting look into how animation worked. There's always the background. There's always the foreground. Whenever you look at animation cells, you'll notice that it's kind of like this clear plastic, Mm -hmm. not paper, but whatever it is. But it's only the character that's on there. The background's not even included on it. So the way that they would actually animate is that they would line up the camera the camera would actually be facing down Mm -hmm. so it'd be like suspended up in the air looking down and then they would put a background lay it down and they would perfectly frame that and then they would start laying down the different frames of the characters moving around Mm -hmm. so every time they lay down a new frame they would actually take the camera and they would only record it for maybe one or two frames at a time Mm -hmm. and that's how they would do that and i know that you know one of the big pieces of camera technology when my friend gave me an insider's tour of walt (laughs) disney animation studios i got to see Mm -hmm. the original multi-plane camera this is the plan for a super cartoon camera we call it the multi-plane camera disney used where they had a bunch of different you know planes set up as background images Mm -hmm. but had it so they can move at different speeds so it looks like as somebody is moving through a scene the different background elements you know don't all move like with it so it it gives that extra sense of depth and like the ways that cameras get used that a lot of people Mm -hmm. don't realize go into animation yeah, there's so much ingenuity that comes to like this early animation, and it's just fascinating. And yeah. it's something that we have kind of lost nowadays because we're animating now using computers mm-hmm. mostly, and we might as well use that technology today and take advantage of it. But it was interesting to see like how things used to be done. Yeah, I'm not saying that we should ever go back to it, but it is really yeah. inspiring to see the ingenuity of people who were creating, you know, the technology, Mm -hmm. they're creating the ideas of what would become the technology we use for animation and being like, well, what if we tried it this way and try to figure Mm -hmm. out how they can use the physical elements to create what they want to make? It's fascinating. But not on the Thief and the Cobbler. They didn't pay for any of that. (laughs) No, he didn't. They had to save as much money as possible. Really what they were trying to do by saving all this money by doing pencil sketches is just to show anyone who is interested any producers studios anything like that to show like we have this entire movie it's all animated we just got to put the finishing touches on everything Mm -hmm. yeah almost like showing somebody the animatics now yes so they started working on more projects they were doing more commercials and then the studio took on the feature Raggedy Ann and Andy, a musical adventure. No, squash me a banana, drowned in jelly, tutti fruity, by the score, marzipan and pastry, drenched in butter, caramel and gingerbread galore. Which they managed to create and they released the film on April 1st of 1977. The film got varied reviews and ultimately did poorly in the theaters but i know there's a style about richard williams that you'll start to recognize especially after watching through a lot of either roger rabbit or watching the thief and the cobbler you start to recognize all that and watching the little bits of raggedy ann like you definitely see a lot of that style in there when you mentioned that he did work on roger rabbit at the beginning it really made me think about that opening sequence of roger rabbit the sequences Mm -hmm. that i've seen of the thief and the cobbler 
it's like really expressive and he plays with scale in different ways of things, you know, mm-hmm. getting close to the quote unquote camera and really mm-hmm. like expanding in scale to an unrealistic degree, but mm-hmm. it works for animation, but also like all these little pieces moving in tandem. And it makes me think about in that opening sequence of Roger Rabbit of the baby climbing up the dishes and the way that all the Mm. dishes slide down and fly in Roger Rabbit's face. And you can see that the attention to detail of each individual plate changing in size and moving in its own way. I think how he utilizes the space is very interesting where you don't feel as if you're just animating characters in front of a background. It feels as if you're living in that area and him to actually translate what is hand drawn and making you believe that you're actually moving around this world in a 3D world compiled entirely in 2D sketches is just absolutely incredible. Yeah, yeah. I feel like he gets that realism by exaggerating even more. There's definitely a lot of things that happen in Roger Rabbit and the way the characters move that is completely unrealistic. But if somebody was consciously trying to be like, I'm going to make this look realistic, it becomes less realistic and it creates a different divide in your brain. And he Mm -hmm. has this way of like leaning into the exaggerated in a way that makes it feel more present. Yeah. It's like capturing the way you feel about an event as opposed Mm -hmm. to capturing the event exactly as it would happen. It feels like you're part of it or you're in it. Yeah, yeah. Rather than just like a spectator. I've already done these commercials violating the rules and and I know you can use a moving camera. We have to draw every frame and we have to draw every frame in perspective as the camera's coming closer or going around him. So there's a lot of work for us and very expensive, but that's going to make it work. So to make extra cash, they turn the studio into a school to teach young artists and show them how to animate themselves. Dick actually brought on a few well-renowned animators to teach him these intense courses like Amori Hawkins, known for reworking and making famous Woody Woodpecker. Okay. There's Art Babbitt, a Disney animator known for developing Goofy. Grim Natwick, known for animating Betty Boop and Snow White. They were not just recruited to teach, though, but they were also working at the studio. They were making commercials, working on Raggedy Ann and The Thief. They're working on all this stuff on top of that, teaching these students. Dick was no doubt a big fan of their work and actually took this opportunity to learn as much as he could from these animators. Unfortunately for me... I had to learn it the hard way over years and years. I ended up employing some of my teachers in order to learn from them. Williams also went out of his way to learn from other animators like Milt Cowell, Frank Thomas, Ollie Johnson, and Ken Anderson, who all worked for the Disney Animation Studios. Now, you probably know of Frank Thompson and Ollie Johnson, right? Frank and Ollie? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, so he would often go across and actually go to, I think he went to Warner Brothers as well, Warner Brothers and Disney Studios, and just kind of got familiar with a lot of the animators at the time. So he's a fan of animation, and all he wanted to do his whole life was just learn how to animate better and learn different techniques from all these other animators. Money was still a factor in trying to make this film, and Williams was determined to not only make this the best piece of art that he will ever create, but he believed that this would be the best animated feature of all time. He wanted everything to look beautiful and complex, which only delayed the production even further. To make this process even further complex, Dick wanted the frames to be drawn in ones instead of the industry standard twos. Do you understand what that means, drawn in ones? Yeah, yeah. Where it would be moving at... 24 frames per second film reel, 24 Mm -hmm. frames per second instead of 12 frames per second. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that animated films at the time were done in 12 frames per second. Was that a pretty common thing for hand-drawn animation? I knew that was a common thing for uh, stop motion. I guess it is, is that it's done typically in 12 frames per second. The jargon is that you're either drawing in ones or twos or even threes when you're drawing these. But for Williams to take on that he wanted ones, meaning that you would have to draw 24 pictures for one second. Like you can imagine that this is 
taxing on the animators and why it takes so long to do it. I wonder if animation at the time like had sheets to where it was only having to draw on the twos, but still was able to create something that looked like a 24 frames per second, you know, film. But I'm not sure about that. That's interesting. I don't think they would do anything like that today. I know that there were a lot of cheats that animators would use. So, for example, like if a character was speaking, if the character didn't have to move around as much, usually their head would stay frozen. And then the only thing that was being animated was just their mouth. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of shortcuts here. But for this movie in particular, he did not want that at all, which you can actually see in the movie like their movements is so much more fluid than any other type of animation that i'm used to and it's so strange to look at it's not just a character on the background either like this is all being drawn as one which is why when you enter like that 3d space where you can move around throughout the setting like that all has to be hand drawn instead of just making a background and just kind of moving things out of the way like Disney or Warner Brothers used to do. It does look like that a lot of Mm -hmm. 2D at the time is drawn on twos, which I never really realized. But in a lot of cases when there would be like a lot of movement or stuff happening, they would have Mm -hmm. in-between frames. So they would have something called tweening. In digital animation, this is pretty common where you say, this is where my object starts at the beginning of this keyframe, and this is where it ends at this keyframe, and the computer fills it in between that. But a lot of early animation would have assistants to go in Mm -hmm. and animate those in between frames and basically in a way of kind of copying the work over, but just like adjusting it slightly. Yeah. But I guess that is very different to what Richard Williams is having his crew do in Mm -hmm. hand drawing every single of the 24 frames per second. Yeah. And if the first project was three hours long, that's three hours. Oh my goodness. Let's do some math here. (laughs) We're just going to say three hours. So that's a total of 108 minutes, which is a total of 10,800 seconds times 24. Whew. Okay. So overall, they had to draw 259,200 frames. Wow. Whew. That's That's a lot. And what's really impressive is the smoothness and the way the motion works it really stands out as well like how crisp all of the animation matches up and like that takes a ton Mm -hmm. of work as well and really it shows that these were the best animators at the top of their craft who were able to pull this off yeah and it's just so gorgeous watching the movements especially with someone like zigzag the way that zigzag walks whenever he puts his foot down his foot is curled up and then when he steps down his foot uncurls and extends out Mm. seeing that movement so fluid is just so fascinating and interesting now i'm not sure if you're about to get to this but do you have anything about how these animators felt about doing this much work i mean were they like oh this is crazy and ridiculous or were they like yes bring me the challenge let's do this right i feel like it's a little column a column b where they're working on this passion project but they're also working on something that's challenging them yes they're working for williams to create his passion project but they're creating and making something that's visually interesting Uh, i know that dick though was a perfectionist when it came to these animations so a lot of times if something didn't come out right he would have the animators redo a lot of those scenes redo a lot of the animations there so yeah it's not just whatever number i figured out (laughs) two hundred fifty nine thousand. on top of that it's redoing a lot of that as well Yeah, yeah. So I imagine it's immensely frustrating, but I imagine that it's also rewarding to see that you are creating animation that no one else has ever seen or even attempted to do before. Yeah, absolutely. So money was still an issue with the studio, and they definitely weren't making enough to fund the project. So we are now in 1978. Dick 
actually turned to the Saudi Arabian prince Mohammed bin Faisal al Saud to help what? finance the production. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Much like Jerry Lewis going to <laughs> Iran, <laughs> he found a Saudi prince who would possibly help him do it. So wow. the prince actually agreed to fund them a hundred thousand dollars to create a 10 minute sequence. The scene that William chose was the destruction of the war machine, which undoubtedly is the most complex sequence in the film. In fact, it was so complex that they were actually putting it off for the longest time because they knew how difficult it would be. But seeing that they were actually going to get paid for these few minutes, he figured he might as well just wow the Saudi prince and be like, okay, yeah, we'll wow him and he'll definitely be on board. The sequence actually went far over budget. It actually ended up costing them $250,000 instead. And they missed two deadlines to complete the sequence, <laughs> which not great. Eventually, they finished in 1979. Muhammad was impressed by their work and the animation really inspired the studio to keep working on the film, but in the end, the prince actually backed out of financing the film. It's interesting to think about how a problem that has been fairly pervasive throughout the story of film, but really kind of any art and entertainment in general, is this idea of appropriation. And especially mm -hmm. appropriation of culture and stories from the Middle East. I mean, you've got mm -hmm. everything from Lawrence of Arabia to Aladdin. Like, there's a bunch happening there of this kind of mysticism mm -hmm. of the Middle East. And it is interesting, though, thinking about this project. Yes, it is, you know, a white director and white creator. But this one actually mm -hmm. had a start from Persian stories and had the involvement yeah. of a Saudi prince. I was <laughs> not expecting that part to uh, tie into this story. <laughs> Yeah, this happened, the Saudi prince backed out. The film looked like it would just never get off the ground. The studio struggled to get back into the swing of things, but eventually got back to work in making commercials and other jobs, which included the 1982 TV special Ziggy's Gift. Ah, you've come about the center position. Very good. Come in. <laughs> come in. Yes, yes. Oh, cold enough for you. <laughs> which also won the studio an Emmy. <laughs> <laughs> On top of all this bad luck, they lost one of the greatest animators, which was one of Dick's mentors, Ken Harris. When Ken Harris, who is now unfortunately dead, who he animated half of our picture of the thief. And he came here when he was 69 years old, 14 years ago, and he we worked with him for years. I used to work in the next room there with him or in here. And I was both his student and his director one day in there. This was after several hours, and, he, and I was getting the drawings right. And he said, he said, gee, Dick, he said, you're putting them in the, almost in the right place. And I said, well, I'm learning from you, aren't I? And he said, yeah. He said, he said, you know, you could be an animator. And I, I was devastated. I just sat there for a bit. I said, excuse me, Ken. I went out and I sat on the stairs out here for a while and I had to think, no, he's right. I mean, the reason I admired him so much is that he was the real McCoy. I had been earning my living covered in awards. I wasn't really an animator. I didn't understand how to get that snap into the drawings or the timing or just, I mean, I just did animation drawings. And anyway, so I worked like hell. I had this section of of a magician with cards, which turned out in the end to be zigzag in the picture. I even wrote the scene into the picture to use this scene and go, it went on for years. I was trying to have this fellow work shuffling cards and spreading the cards out. And he's talking all at the same time. And I spent, a whole, when Ken went away, he would go away for four to six months to recover because he was so old and he was 70, 76, 77. Then he came back. And I had this scene, and I, we never discussed it, whether I was an animator or not. Again, I didn't. Did. And then I ran this thing on the movie Ola, which used to be across the hall. And, he, and I had it more or less right. And he looked up, and he says, it was as if it was the conversation the year before. He said, he said very grudgingly, he says, all right. He says, you are an animator. 
actually passed away at the age of 83 of Parkinson's disease on March 12th of 1982. To be animating that long till you're in your 80s, that's crazy. In the 80s, Williams continued to find financing for the film. He compiled a 20-minute reel of The Thief to show producers the film's potential. He showed the reel to Disney animator Milt Call at the Skywalker Ranch. This actually caught the attention of the Star Wars producer Gary Kurtz, who helped get financing for The Thief, but eventually left the project. In 1986, Dick met the producer Jake Eberts, and through his company Allied Filmmakers, they provided $10 million out of the $28 million budget that this film needed in order for it to be complete. With Eberts on board, he wanted to make some changes to the script, like Princess Yum Yum had an identical twin sister, Mimi, and another sister, Bubba, which turned out to be an ogre. Those characters got deleted. (laughs) Some of Grim Matwick's animation of The Witch got deleted, as well as Ken Harris's scene where the brigand is dreaming of a biblical temptress. Hmm. When you watch the film, there is a recobbled cut, and we'll talk about the recobbled cut Mm -hmm. eventually. But you'll definitely tell that, and I think a lot of the problems with why this movie went belly up is because the content was made for more of an adult audience. Mm. And animation wasn't really looked at as a medium for just children. Because at the time, like we're dealing with the 80s now, at the time... Disney animated features didn't really hit their like 90s prime where any animated movie that was coming out at that time was looked at as only for children. Yeah, yeah. And I think when a lot of those changes were made, a lot of it was to make sure that this was going to be appropriate for kids and appropriate for families. Yeah. They were all sacrifices that Dick had to make to, I mean, to sustain the production, but... Allied's distribution partner, Majestic Films, began promoting the film under the working title Once. So now we have another title change (laughs) from The Thief to Once. Yeah. (laughs) The studio was getting a lot of attention for its ambitious animation, including the attention of Steven Spielberg, Mm. who saw the potential in Williams' animation and his ability to blend in cartoons with live action sequences. So this is something that I didn't mention before, but... With their commercials, they were actually starting to blend in live action and animation before Roger Rabbit. Mm. They were using an animating characters that were owned by major studios. So one commercial that sticks out was a Fanta commercial that was done around either 84 or 85. But that commercial featured Disney characters like Mickey, Pluto, Donald Duck, and Goofy. Now with real fruit juice and added vitamin C. Make friends with new Fanta. And that production was done by Tick Williams Animation Studio. They were looking at, I guess, once, and then Steven Spielberg was looking through all their past stuff and was like, oh, this will be interesting. This eventually led Williams and his studio to be left in charge of adding the animated sequences to Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Mm. (laughs) Boy, did you see that? This was great and bad news for Williams because the studio would be receiving a great deal of money and recognition to take on the film, but it would backtrack Williams' plan to make The Thief. Roger Rabbit ended up being a huge hit. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're in the future. We (laughs) see this coming. (laughs) It's just amazing the way those cartoon characters are integrated with the real thing. It's terrifically well done. So well done that after a while, you give up trying to figure things out and just go along with the story, which has some serious undertones as those tunes are treated like second-class citizens. Who Framed Roger Rabbit is a co-production of the Disney and Spielberg companies, directed by Bob Zemeckis, who made Back to the Future, and the animation is by Richard Williams, who's Raggedy Ann and Andy, we liked several years ago. It made over $156 million domestically and $330 million worldwide. It received seven Oscar nominations with four wins. Williams got two 
of those Oscars for Best Effects, Visual Effects, and a Special Achievement Award for Animation Direction and Creation of the Cartoon Characters. He also won a BAFTA for Best Special Effects, a Saturn Award from the Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror Films for Best Special Effects, and an Annie Award for Best Individual Achievement, Technical Achievement. Yeah. Even with all of that success, knowing the thief was still in production during this, you can actually hear in his Oscar speech, one of the last things that he says is, the best is yet to come. Thank you. Thanks. The best is yet to come. 1989, Dick was on top of his game, and he was getting the attention of Warner Brothers this time. They agreed to finance the production for $50 million. Half of it would go into production, and then the other half would go into marketing. Warner Brothers signed a deal with the Completion Bond Company to make sure the film would be completed, which actually put a lot of pressure on Williams. Yeah. This deal would mean that Dick would have to complete the film at a certain deadline, which we know he's not that great at. (laughs) If he could not meet that, the completion bond company would have to take over the production. Mm. So we're kind of seeing little seeds here into like why this movie may not have done so well. Yeah. I know that's a pretty common thing for a lot of movies. You know, it's like getting insurance Mm -hmm. that if it's, you know, the studio can basically say, hey, if this doesn't get finished at this point, we have the rights to take control and release it however we need to. Mm -hmm. And most movies don't need to have that happen, but I know it is a pretty common practice. So a lot of the original animators were either dead or they moved on to other projects. So William actually had to get a whole new team of young animators that he would find from Europe and Canadian art schools. He even hired his own son, Alexander Williams, to animate alongside with his dad. So think about this. (laughs) He conceived of this project and then had his son, if I get the timeline right, I think he had him like two years after. So 19... 66, I think, is when he was born. And then, like, 20 years later, he's working Working on on the project (laughs) his dad was working on before he was born. That's uh, That's a crazy concept. Based off of having four separate marriages, Richard Williams probably Mm -hmm. isn't the best at home life and how he treats his family. Mm -hmm. That's got to be such an interesting relationship of whatever's going on there. I mean, the work environment was not easy either. In fact, because of the pressure that was put on Dick, it became much more brutal in the studio. Not only were they working with the deadline, but he wanted to make sure that everything was perfect. The animators were working overtime, usually about 60 hours per week. On top of that, the animators were getting fired left and right. Cameraman John Leatherborough stated he fired hundreds of people. There's a list as long as your arm, people fired by Dick. It was a regular event. There was one guy who got fired on the doorstep. <laughs> oh, so, man. He is becoming unhinged. It is driving him nuts. Oftentimes, he would be the first person in the studio, and he would be the last person to leave. I'm surprised he'd leave at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the pressure was put on him because the funders wanted to see finished scenes of the main character so they could actually start making a marketing trailer. He also received source funds from Japanese investors who pulled out of the production during the recession caused by the Japanese assets price bubble. Not knowing the economics of Japan, I have (laughs) no idea what that means, but I imagine it's bad. And knowing that we've gone through a recession and we're going through another one now, it's not good. Yeah. (laughs) Not good stuff. During this time... Disney began hitting their stride when it came to animated features. They had done animated features in the past, but not as frequently as when they began starting in the late 1980s and then leading into the 90s. Ironically, it was actually because of Who Framed Roger Rabbit that they realized that there was an audience for animation in the mainstream. And it all started with Little Mermaid. And making it a 
making these grandiose films. And this was done in 1989. And then there was Rescuers Down Under in 1990. And then the year after that, 91, is Beauty and the Beast. And the next project that they would take on was an Arabian-themed musical called Aladdin. One jump ahead of the bread line. One swing ahead of the sword. I steal only what I can afford. That's everything. Mm. Now, Williams Studio had actually caught wind of the production and went as far as blaming Disney for ripping them off, which might have been more coincidental because the idea came from the playwright and the lyricist Howard Ashman, who previously worked on Little Shop of Horrors, The Little Mermaid, and The Beauty and the Beast. He simply wanted to make a musical based on a story from A Thousand and One Nights. In defense of uh, Richard Williams, the person running Disney animation at the time is Jeffrey Katzenberg. And Jeffrey Katzenberg definitely has a storied history when it comes to plagiarism. Hmm. There's been a lot of accusations about the Lion King plagiarizing from a Japanese movie, but some more obvious uh, situations. After he left Disney Pictures in the mid-90s, he went on to co-found DreamWorks. (gasps) He is the K in DreamWorks SKG. Hmm. And DreamWorks, he saw, oh, hey, we want to do some computer animation I'll make the villain in Shrek look exactly like the guy who took over my job, Michael Eisner. Hmm. Some of you may die, but it's a sacrifice I am willing to make. Also, Pixar is doing a movie about bugs. Let's rush our production of Ants. They Hmm. did that and got it out literally two months before A Bug's Life came out just to try to take money from Pixar, essentially. So Hmm. Katzenberg definitely has a history of being shady when it comes to the way he deals with his competition. Mm -hmm. Now he is the main mind behind Quibi. So, uh, Mm -hmm. he's a guy. (laughs) Okay. Both Aladdin and The Thief and the Cobbler do have a lot of their similarities. So, Mm -hmm. for example, there's the main thief character, Aladdin. There is Jafar, who has an odd resemblance to Zigzag. Even some of the animators from Williams Studio worked on Aladdin as well. Mm -hmm. So, there was Andreas Deja who worked on Jafar and Eric Goldberg, who animated the genie. You'd probably think like this would really anger Dick. Yeah. He actually looked at a lot of the similarities and overall he just didn't care. Hmm. He was so focused on it. He knew that he came up with the idea first and he's like, you know what? I'll let the work speak for itself when it comes out. Yeah. Which could totally be the case if this was like a, an ant's bug's life situation. In the end, it didn't matter that Ants came out first. Nobody remembers that movie. Oh, no, they don't. (laughs) Even though Dick didn't care, do you know who did really care, though? Warner Brothers and Hmm. the Completion Bond Company. So the Bond Company, they sent over the producer, Fred Calver, to Williams Studio to check on the production and come back with a report on their progress. Fred Calvert, if you don't know, was at the time a television producer and then just started dabbling in movie production. Uh, But he was mostly known for television at this point. And he noticed right away that everything was a mess. The animators were working long hours and they were behind on schedule. Plus, the script wasn't fully complete. And here's the kicker. At this time, this is when Dick decided to start creating storyboards. (laughs) For the Thief and the Cobbler. Oh, boy. You know, something that you do at the beginning of the production. Yeah. Oh, boy. (laughs) The reason for those storyboards, it wasn't to actually help the animators or, like, help map out the scenes. The reason for those storyboards was because Williams knew that he would not be able to finish the production. So he figures that if he could fill in some of those scenes that were incomplete with storyboards, then the studio could still get what's going on in the movie and say, like, hey, you know, it's there but we just got to fill the rest of this in. Even if it was taken out of his hands, you know, by the Bond Mm -hmm. company, at the very Mm -hmm. least, a little bit more of his vision would make it into what they were creating. 
I'm definitely going back and forth on how I feel about this guy. And in general, I think there is a line that he's probably crossed as far as Mm -hmm. being uh, too obsessive over his work. I would have expected Richard Williams, based off of what we've learned about him, to say, no, nobody else can finish this except Mm -hmm. for me. I want to make sure that this happens. But he really does seem to be like, this work is too important beyond me, so I need to make sure that whoever Mm -hmm. gets this after it can at least get close to what I was trying to do here. It's so interesting to like think of this mentality that he's been working on this for so long. In the book Art and Fear, it was a ceramics class, and the professor decided to split the class into two different sections and grade them differently. And he told one half of the class, hey, you have one bowl to make, and that's it. And you have to make it perfect. And then he told the other half of the class, hey, you know what? Just make 50 bowls. If you make 50 bowls, you get an A. 40, you get a B, and so on. And at the end of the year, something interesting happened. The class started noticing that the students who were involved in quantity were making much better bowls than those who were focused on quality. And that's because the students who were focused on quality were just so fixated and focused on trying to make the perfect bowl that they didn't really think of learning from their mistakes. And this is a different situation because for Williams, I mean, he's running an animation studio that's also working on other things. I mean, you heard that the studio made 2,300 commercials and they made movies and they did uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit. So, like, they're getting the practice in they're they know what they're doing but this fixation on just doing one project can really distort what the final product would be yeah absolutely and i think that's what's going on in williams head this is kind of the turning point because in not only the history of the thief and the cobbler but for richard williams himself The day that everything changed was on May 13th of 1992. Two weeks before I was born. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) That was my clock that fell. Weird. Okay. Oh, was that making a ticking sound? Possibly. (laughs) That will be the end of part one. All right. This was a ton of story that we got through, and I'm kind of shocked that we're only halfway done. I'm excited to hear what happens next. Oh, yeah. Certainly a roller coaster ride. Before our next episode, I'm going to go ahead and actually watch one of the cuts of this that exists out there, and I'm sure that's something that will give more background to when we get into uh, the next episode, but I'm excited to keep talking about this. Yeah, it's a fascinating story, and knowing the story behind it and then watching the movie it definitely makes things a lot more interesting to watch. It's kind of like how some stories behind the movie is much more interesting than the story themselves. It's it's like Heart of Darkness or Apocalypse Now. You ever see Hearts of Darkness? Way better than Apocalypse Now. Yeah, see? It's exactly that. That was, of course, me quoting Louise Guzman (laughs) in Community. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But yeah, that'll uh, conclude the first part We'll come right back, and we are going to complete the story of what happened to the thief and the cobbler. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, so much for listening. Go find more episodes at PipeDreamPodcast.com. We would also love to receive emails from you. Uh, You can send those emails to NotGetMade at gmail.com. Talk to us about movies that you would love us to cover or things that we may have missed. This show is as much about us learning about these stories as it is talking about them. So anything that you have to share, we would love to hear. You can also connect with us on Twitter at HGTNGM or on Instagram at How Did This Not Get Made. And we'll see you next time. Bye bye. Then